Well, thanks for turning out on this summer, what is it, spring evening in 1916, sorry, 2016, <laughs> which is 100 years since uh, something happened in Zurich, which I think was the Cabaret Voltaire, uh, and a performance which is accredited to be the start of um, Dada. So in celebration of that, um, and because I said I would, I'm going to do a lecture uh, on um, performance actually um, on Dharma. Here's the lecture, and um, I've started, but um, as you see the first film, I'm going to be tearing the lecture up. Okay, so then, um, then we'll see if we can, perhaps between us, reconstruct something of value from the remnants of my lecture. So the first act is going to be uh, for you to watch the film, um, and then I'm going to destroy the lecture during that film, and then we're going to see where it goes, okay? So I hope you're ready to help me, uh, because it's a little bit unknown. Um, the film is, um, uh, is, has, has me in it. It's not actually um, made by me, it's made by my son. Uh, but it's me in it. And it was made um, at Dungeness, which is a place, so I'm a dada in this film. And um, the daddy, see? Yeah. And um, we used to go there and play. Um, and it was real joy to me to make a film that was really based on my son and I playing a game um, at uh, Dungeness. I mean, he doesn't know that. He thought he was the director. Uh, he thought he'd been commissioned to make the film, but I know better. It was a chance for us to play again uh, on the beach at, at Dungeness. So that's the film I'm going to show. And as I said, I'm going to be tearing up my lecture during that. And then with your help, uh, reconstructing it. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. We know now that at the beginning of the 21st century, this world was inhabited by a vast civilization. The archaeologist sent us these pictures of a colossal hive of synthetic material containing within labyrinthine networks threaded together in a tangled swarm. Highly skilled in psychic projection, the archaeologist was able to infiltrate the system with his mind. And go deep inside this forgotten world. Thank <laughs> you. 
the bits of my lecture, I put in some question marks as well. Um, so creativity is minimum context, it says here. But it's quite interesting to take the idea that every work of art has within it a minimum content, which is a statement about the nature of its production. I find John Stetiker's work very interesting. And in a way, the minimality of it, you put something with something, seems to be a really interesting notion about what creativity is. Or even you have something and you take something out. So those wonderful pictures of the void kind of taken out, they seem to me to be a notion of a, of a kind of potential game around creativity, a potential minimum content that he's telling us what the creative act is. Um, this one here, I will find you one moment to um, which is the postcard to revelate across the face. I mean, that works very well, and I think, you know, it's, it's, I think it's written in the catalogue as being something um, about appropriation that he's, he's connected with Dada through appropriation. But I actually see, I prefer, my, my connection is that you take that postcard and you stick it on the face, and it shouldn't, the two worlds, the two totally alien things kind of coming together. But there's meaning. I think Dada is in partly about the impossibility of non-meaning. Whatever you do, whatever you say, however you try and garble it, however you try and chew it up, however you try and go back to some primal state, Meaning just won't go away, partly because meaning is obviously 
created by the audience, created by the viewer, and not created by the artist. I think also that abrogation of the duty to be in charge as the artist and handing over to the audience, I think, is, uh, is a really good one. So, I, I allow myself the rules, of course, to change the rules if they're not suiting me at any time. Um, meaning and nonsense impossibilities. Because how extraordinary I was just saying that. Uh, it says meaning and nonsense, the impossibility of no meaning. Uh, meaning is always present. So we dealt with that one, so we can move on. Oh yes, it's got swarm, swarm intelligence and, and, and community. Um, it's a relief. Um, the, the, the Dardais were, were um, as I understand it, in, uh, uh, in, in Zurich, which I think is right, is in, in Switzerland. Is that right? Really help you? Yeah. And none of them were Swiss. So in 1916, there was a community in Zurich, in Switzerland, and none of them were Swiss. How did that happen? Well, they were all refugees. They were running from the war. And perhaps one of their fundamental political statements was to have run from the war, to not be in the war, to uh, have run away. And that primal intelligence to run away, to not be in the war, to refuse war by running away, seems to me something we shouldn't forget in the way that they created the powerful, extraordinary sense of presence that runs through contemporary art and which can still stimulate us and help us to make things now. I think I'd like to go a bit further than that really because I think one of the things about Dardo is they're relocating uh, creativity. If we pointed to where creativity is, was, might be, I think a lot of us, I think I certainly would, would have pointed here or maybe even here or something like that. But I think for Dada, creativity is kind of some liminal zone, it's in between, it's part of the community, it's part of the difficulty of meaning, it's part of the, the strangest of meaning that has to be constructed uh, in, 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 its, in its event and, is, and it makes us aware uh, that the simplicity of meaning is, 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 is a kind of mirage. It makes me think too that this kind of, what we might need, and there's a very big involvement I think now with what we might call swarm intelligence, there's a lot of people writing about it, uh, about the idea that um, creatures and humans, ants, uh, ants are being used in uh, computer programs that, that think to solve problems the way that ants do, so that little elements react with other elements and they react with other elements and they respond in such a way so that we get the wonderful swirling masses uh, of the murmuration uh, and the extraordinary structures um, of, of ants. Uh, and no ant is thinking that up. There is no ant mastermind, no ant genius. It is some sort of process in between them. Uh, and I was reading something the other day that talked about that swarm intelligence, that sort of sense of an interactive intelligence. Uh, and in terms of refugees, it might mean perhaps that um, the migrations at the moment and the refugees who are flying across Europe represent in a sense one of the most powerful forms of direct political action that's occurring at the moment. Just like the Dardais refused war and refused to stay put in their countries and be called up uh, and be mashed uh, in the war, then certain people are refusing to stay where they're told to be they're refusing the laws which allegedly govern their own slaughter and their destruction. And through the use of a kind of digital swarm by contacting each other with uh, 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 mobile phones, they're actually creating an environment where they move intelligently, uh, and they move forcefully, and they move purposefully, uh, and possibly even as the Dardos would have seen themselves, I think, move uh, politically. Um, the Dardos in, in, in some senses I think was more like Sharma. They, uh, they, they performed. Uh, and I have a problem with that in a way because I think that sort of, uh, sort of notion of allowing the artist to uh, sort of become some kind of god, some kind of super celebrity, um, some kind of person possessed of powers uh, that others don't um, is, uh, is really problematic. So 
Um, this would have made sense, of course, in the Cagliari lecture, but coming as it does as an isolated point, it would just have to stand for itself. It's a great word, isn't it? Before Dada, there was Dada. Before Dada, there was Lobbledigoo. Um, the idea of disrupting language, perhaps we have to disrupt things before we can create things. Uh, Bakhtin talked about uh, the difference of a language which tends towards fixed meaning and tends towards, in that sense, ideology, and a language which tends towards unfixed meaning and in that sense, it tends towards a kind of utopia. That the possibilities of language suggested by language, which is nearly nonsense, is quite radical. And the terror of a language which has an absolute meaning uh, is something that I think perhaps we should all at times want to get away from. And in fact, language won't do that. It won't give us an absolute meaning, uh, and it won't either give us nonsense. It's always operating, I would suggest, somewhere between the two. Take a nice one. Before Dada was Dada, always there, something about creativity. So I like this idea that the Dadaists of all the modernists perhaps least saw themselves as invented within that statement as a Dadaist statement. Before Dada was Dada. Something always there. And I think that, that use of Dada, which is, I think I understand it, um, the words dad and mum, Dada, mama are pretty universal in the sense that the human voice's propensity or the infant's propensity to make those sounds gets projected by their parents back onto them, yes? He said, she said, dada. He said, mama, you know? But maybe the mama and the dada preceded that language. So there's a wonderful thing, I think, of a kind of er-ness, um, uh, kind of er-language, a kind of er, er, er sound. The other kind of literal way of, of dealing with dada uh, that often comes up is that it's two words meaning there, 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 which of course has a, in the context of just, everything means in relation to everything else, so in relation to a baby, the there, there is not what I'm talking about. It's the idea of pointing to something. And I think that's really interesting in what um, dada art does. It kind of points to things. And sometimes it points at two things simultaneously, it kind of brings them, it's sort of that kind of bring things in. I was brought up in a wonderful education system which encouraged excess expressivity and creativity. But I always thought, or I was led to believe, it was somehow to come from inside. And for some strange reason I really, really wanted to be an artist. But I was afflicted with the notion that there was absolutely nothing inside that I had. So I thought, you know, there were all these other people looked inside and they found poems and they found great paintings and things like that. I, I, I looked inside and I found absolutely nothing, you know. Uh, uh, so, so that was a real sort of terror to me, so I used to have to fake it, that there was something inside, you know. Um, but I think the idea that there doesn't have to be something inside, that the trajectory of art can be towards recognising things in the world, uh, and pointing things out, and dealing with things that are already there, but making them seen in a different way, is, is, is kind of wonderful. One of my favourite John Sezikas is the one straight ahead of me there. And it's the chap with the eyebrows. Um, and there's absolutely nothing done to that photo, which I think is so wonderful because one expects in a John Sezikas something to be done to the photo. So you go to that photo, and I thought well, something has been done to it, but the thing that's been done to that photo was already done to the person before the photo was taken. And now I see it now as though it's been done to that person. Um, he has actually drawn his eyebrows on, and that, you know, that. That, that happens quite a lot. Uh, but I think that's actually wonderful, that sort of sense of that photo. He's just pointing to that photo, but pointing to it in a way that he's encouraged us to see by looking at other things. So what we see when he points is not the same as what somebody else would see uh, when they point. If you, if, you, if you can get what I'm seeing, saying, pointing out. Okay, we, thank you very much. Have you, have you told you one? Oh, hands off. Yes, thank you. That's hands off. And I, I started. I'm thinking I started that one. So, if you can take over. Thank you very much. Okay, um, this is, um, this is uh, a default. So, now it says that we have to go to uh, Glitch.
which is a, um, a one of the, I, I think, um, when you connect things, things happen, so, and the connectivity of things is very strange, so I find it strange that John Sissica was here when I thought I was quite recently making art that has some connection with his. So um, I'm going to show you some of that art. This comes from something I did called Glitch 2015, but if we can start the projector, uh, yeah, thank you, and just click through until we get the picture. You can read it if you like, but don't bother. William Blake, he said, I'm as great as a system will be enslaved by another man's. And I think Dada is kind of refusing to accept, pathologically refusing to accept a system, perhaps. Okay, connection, please. Okay, um, I think what John Sessica is doing with um, different kinds of um, images, I was quite keen, I started doing with Mark's images. I love the fact that if you put a mark, you attack a photo with a mark, then you get this tension between a mark that is a non-photographic mark and how we read that, and a mark which is a photographic mark and how we read them. And in something like the same way with John Sixman, we don't actually kind of completely uh, abandon the possibility of meaning that. We tend to read an augmented face. Uh, and when that face perhaps comes in relation to this mark, because these two are faces, then there's a tendency to want that meaning to bleed across into that. So I was playing around with some of those ideas. There's John Sessica, and I think that beautifully shows what he's done. Okay. Uh, and I started attacking books. Uh, this is a book, these are books on, on, on kind of biological, uh, they're, they're from the Pit Rivers, which is a very beautiful place. And I found that I just hold these sort of marks that are made that are just really raw marks, really almost unintentional, irrational marks, actually strangely adopt organic forms. Uh, the, the simple marks that are made, um, they mimic at some deep level. You know? <laughs> Is that, I don't know what's going on there. I think possibly because we're formed by gravity and liquid uh, and repetition, that there's a certain kind of inevitability in that. Anyway. Uh, uh, so then I started attacking photographs, and they were, um, it was this book of uh, photographs of um, Victorian artists. And I found it very easy to be very annoyed with Victorian artists and photographs. Uh, they, they deal with my sort of, my problems with patriarchy, uh, and my problems with authority, uh, and they allow me a, a, an outlet. Um, so I started sort of, uh, uh, kind of attacking these. The, the photograph, these photographs are the first time I've ever had photographs of anybody. I mean, I don't even know that, but that struck me as really extraordinary. How extraordinary a photo is, how, go how, how ghostly it is. Um, we know what Henry VIII looked like, don't we? Except that we don't from a photograph, you know? These are the uh, images of human beings as photographs. And as such, they look totally absurd. Because in a way, we're so distant from the pomposity and the staging and the relationship to painting um, and the way that the photographs are taken. Um, that they look absurd, but they're no more absurd in a sense, or no more cultured than the photos we take now. Uh, it's just it's easy to see them as such. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you do a splat on the face, and I thought, oh yeah, I know what that is, and next slide. And recreated Goya, yes? The bats flying out, you know? The sleep of reason produces monsters of the mind, yes? The sleep of the artist, <laughs> the sleep of the artist not knowing what he's doing, produces something like a Goya by accident. It should be the title of that work. Next, please. And so then you just, you just, it's just great. You just produce all these paintings. <laughs> wow. Um, and um, there's something horrid and baconess and elephant manish about it as we try and kind of pull those uh, um, 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 kind of kind of two marks. Kind of marks together, as we are determined to make meaning uh, in a world which is nonsensical. Okay, next please. Newspaper and, and just tear it apart. It's still a very violent act. You tear a face out of somebody's photograph. 
it doesn't feel good, you know. Well, it does feel good. <laughs> and if you do it in a book, you know, a proper book, that's even better, yes? Now, some, so what, uh, yeah, well, that's fine. Some of them are just extraordinary, you know, what have I done? What have I done? You know, one of my favourite painters, Philip Baston, said, I'm a night painter. That means I go into my studio in the morning and say, my God, what have I done? And I think that's a really interesting thing, you know, about the sort of Dardoist approach, that you don't, you have to sort of not know what you're doing. And by not knowing what you're doing, you're hopefully going to make something you would, better than you would make if you knew what you're doing. There's a kind of wager there. And at least you have a slight bonus that you've slightly surprised yourself. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. That's 250 of those at the moment. I still haven't quite got it out to my system. Okay, who's it? Who's it? Okay, Paul, thanks. The book, um, as, as, as Logos, um, yes, I think it's often referred to as a literary movement, but I think they're a literary movement that kind of hated books in a way. They, they, were, they were attacking the, uh, the ultimate book, which I think probably would be the Bible. Um, they, uh, in the fact that they loved um, uh, and liberated, in a sense, font from meaning, they really cut up letters, um, that they took uh, illustrations out of books. They not only constructed something, um, they attacked something. Uh, and they attacked the fixity um, of, um, of the book uh, and, 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 and of Logos and of the particular kind of authority um, of, of their age. But they not only did that, they, they worked with, uh, with objects. Uh, and part of being uh, uh, an artist who you know, spent a lot of time learning to draw, who um, kind of loves watercolours uh, and pictures that look like things as well, um, it's really interesting to be in contact with groups of artists who um, talk about the object superseding art. Uh, Marcel Duchamp said that we don't need sculpture anymore because we have New York plumbing. And he did actually say that, you know, that it was so, so beautiful. And of course, in the, uh, the fountain where he took uh, the, the pissoir and uh, the, the urinal uh, and pre presented it uh, as art, he was sort of celebrating the object. Of course, he did turn it upside down, so it wasn't an outside of um, But I think the idea that objects um, speak is, is, is really interesting. I, I'm really interested in this idea. Um, I have an object here, which I think really completely aspires to be the most wonderful work of art. It's, it's a little um, camera. It's a joke camera, okay? Don't worry, I'm not going to squirt you. It's not a squirty joke camera. It's a joke camera. I think it comes from America around about the 1930s. And so it's a box camera, okay? And there's a, it's a little lens. Uh, and there's a shutter, as you might expect. Okay, and when you press the shutter, something pops out. And it's a face that pops out. So inside this camera, this joke camera, there's a little face. And when you <laughs> press the shutter, instead of something as it were going into the camera, something comes out of the camera, actually, a, a face. Now I think that that is fundamentally a profound statement uh, of great lyricism and poetry. And it actually links with quite a few things I've been thinking about, about early trick films uh, and the microscopic in film. But it says it much, much better than any paper I could write. Uh, or even uh, a, a, a attempt to write. So I think that's a very beautiful instrument. I'm going to pass this, I'll just pass this one round. Because I think one of the things that um, is nostalgic still is in Dada is, is their attitude towards technology. And I think they saw themselves in a sense as um, at a, um, a, a sense where technology was exciting. And, and where there were new meanings made, being made possible by technology. Um, and I think those were the great mysteries, uh, in a sense, for them. Uh, and, and technologies like uh, the microscope and the telescope um, 
without which I don't think we would have had um, science fiction, we wouldn't have had Nosferatu, which very much links the idea of the microscopic, and particularly I've just read H.G. Wells' War of the World, which is completely related, I think, to a world which is now both microscopic and telescopic, which exceeds the known, both in terms of tininess and sort of, sort of roundness. But this is a 19th century um, field microscope, um, and it has a dead fly in it. And I think that sort of sense of entering into worlds via technologies is something we forget because we see so many things on the screen. So when you're seeing this, you're seeing something that's both real and an image and a technology uh, and susceptible to light in ways that um, are very beautiful in a way. I did that with a lecture in... Um, well, it doesn't matter where it was, but it was a lecture quite a lot of academics in it, and uh, I passed this round. It took me three days to get it back. Some of you have nicked it. But I'm keeping my eyes on it. So. <laughs> okay, so where are we? Oh, thanks. <clears throat> and the mask, I think, is quite interesting and important in the sort of dressing upness. Um, and I think the sort of uh, the, the, the kind of smallness, I think we have to imagine that Cabaret Voltaire probably was something a bit like this, or something like the Veg Box, or I think Tim was working, where a small group of people actually do things which are quite dangerous and do it with people that are, are really there. Uh, I think that might be something that in some senses we, we have to imaginatively um, reconstruct. And I think the whole sort of sense of, of performers and audience in that, uh, and of masking up, is, 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 is really interesting. I think the idea that often said of the mask in small cultures is that the mask both conceals and reveals. But what it does in a sense, it distances the person performing, masking, at that time so that they cease to be actually one of the, the populace. There's something different. But at the same time, it reveals something so that the mask itself reveals something back. And that the interchange, I think, between that is, 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 is really interesting. Um, I, I like the idea where we're all kind of performers and all um, sort of audience um, and a, a kind of culture and community uh, that builds up around that. And I think Dada was very strong in, in, in it all to remind us that art is not just about the celebrity of the maker, it's about the intelligence of, 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 of the audience. Um, you know, I feel first in art education that that's really important because. Um, and uh, occasionally one has met colleagues who don't want to be involved with training people who aren't going to go on to be professional artists, but what is a professional artist without a professional audience, without somebody who can understand their work, who's sympathetic to it, who wants to help create meaning um, alongside the artist. So I think Dada and that sense of community is, is, is really important. What are we doing for time? Um, we'll talk to you, Brian. Go on a little bit longer and then maybe ask some questions. I think I'll do that now because one of them, some of them had questions on, so that was your chance to ask a question before I ask another question. So I'll uh, pretend that I just found another question on it. So unless you ask a question, the whole thing kind of breaks down now. I don't know what to do. suits, you know, uh, painting a painting in the middle of the hugest room with a bearskin rug, you know, and a fire, and you think, what, what, what's going on here, you know. But um, I suppose it's what it, it, in the end I felt quite tender towards them, you know, um, and um, I think one of the things that, that, that there's um, a notion in, um, if, if you try to produce 
of, of haunting, the idea of haunting in exorcism. If you try to produce a totally rational image as they were, yes, then what you have to do is you have to exercise all the irrational from it. And by doing that, in a sense, you highlight exactly the opposite. And I think what the Dadaists did by sort of, as it were, trying to exercise sense, yes, um, they actually, it haunts their work. And in a sense, they're as much involved with that uh, 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 as anybody else. And so I think what's, ten what's, t what's tender and touching in the end about those photos, and even the patriarchal ones, even the misogynist looking ones, even the appallingly um, class ridden, you know, social Darwin looking ones, you know, is, the, is, is that attempt to be rational when we know better, we know what is really going on, you know, inside ourselves and inside everybody else, it doesn't work like that. So I, I think in the end, rather than sort of attacking and feeling aggressive towards that edifice of rationality, you actually feel quite tender towards it. And, um, um, yeah, yeah. Fine, of Yeah. Um, does, uh, your lecture just chucking the table on the floor. I'm oh, sorry. Just think about vandalism and irresponsibility. Mm. <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, I don't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I never really liked Dada for that reason, right? I was a bit frightened, you know, going on to Dada, I went to art college, I thought I can get beaten up, you know, I'm going gonna, gonna to pick on me, you know, but, you know um, um, this is all nonsense, you know. It is a characteristic of what they were trying to do. It is, yeah, it is. Um, it is, yeah. Um, but I think, I think it, it, it's a dialectic with creativity. More, more important, but you need to have, you need to be. Uh, I mean, it's deeply arrogant and stupid, nonsensical to want to make art or try and produce anything of any meaning, isn't it? So that's that's what that's about, really, in a sense. Yes, yeah, good question. I haven't got the answer. Mm. Okay, where are the? Um, do we still have anybody not had a go? Laurie, you had a go. For a newcomer, this is my lecture that I brought up. That's really kind of interesting, the sort of radical nothingness. It reminds me of the situationists, you know, be, uh, be realistic, ask for the impossible, or demand the impossible. Um, the idea that the contradiction is okay, the refusal is okay, the non playing the game is okay, and that that is a sort of statement in itself. And I think that's, that's, that's really quite interesting. I see that uh, perhaps um, politically that you don't have to agree, you just have to refuse uh, and then find out what's in common and I think that's, that's happening quite a lot uh, in some political movements um, at the moment. Kelly? Well, that's probably better. This is, actually, this has happened to me before. I used to write uh, plays really early on with computers. I used to write them in the biro on paper and give them to my friend who had a computer. Because he had a computer and I didn't to word process them. And he couldn't read my handwriting very well, but what he what he put on the computer was much better than what I wrote. So I just we just kept going. So probably better. Marcel Duchamp. Yes. Creativity. Yes. Art, art as ideas, being childish. <laughs> I, I I think I remember that one. <laughs> I think the, the idea of conceptual art, the idea that the primary thing that an artist is making as an idea is something that I, I think has definitely continued from, the, from Dada and that I think was important within that, that it's, it's the idea that's being made. And I think that um, John Stesica has that, he's making ideas out of material stuff. And that links with the idea that we think with objects and think with materials. Uh, so that I think we have to kind of play 
uh, with those things. And I very much like the fact, and I think um, Billy Childish, I heard him say, I think, that if Marcel Duchamp was alive now, he thought he'd be using watercolour just to be difficult because, you know, that's what he would be doing. And I like that idea because I use watercolour myself. Mr. Cameron. I think it's. <laughs> It is not colour though, that is nonsense, but the essence of cannot be that The essence of contemporary is it or the essence of that case that nonsense? I'll make it up. It is not da da that is nonsense, it is the essence of contemporary life that is nonsense. Yes. And then that's And I think that's that's really really profound, you know. It is odd that artists can make things which offend people through being nonsensical, yes? Why, how does that hold when we turn on the television or listen to the radio and hear about this dreadful madness and nonsense that hits the world um, uh, around us? I, I just don't, I think that's a really interesting conundrum um, why that happens. But I think the sort of almost the celebration, the primal celebration of the childish resistance, the childish ability to say something, uh, to still play, to still be in the face of this nonsense, a kind of scream um, of presence uh, and a kind of mad joy uh, is, is, really, um, is really great. Uh, and you know, Dada before Dada and the sort of notion of childhood and play. Uh, I played a game with my sister, I expect we play something like it where we pick a word, say bananas, yes? And we just say the word over and over and over again. And you have to trust me if you haven't played this game, there is a point at which that, become, that word becomes absolutely hilarious, yes? And at that same point, language becomes absolutely hilarious, yes? And I think for us, the whole world of adult structures and being uh, became absolutely hilarious. And we were sort of laughing uh, slightly in, 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 in the face of it. Does it say somewhere else in Wonderland, how do I know what I'm thinking unless I hear myself say it? And I think that, that sort of edginess of, 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 of Dada is important too. That we don't know what we're thinking until we hear ourselves saying it and we don't know what others mean until we try and understand what it is they're saying. And the difficulty uh, is, 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 is very much part of it. Okay, I think I've finished now.